And right now, because we are in the Leonard Nimoy Theater, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, or the one. And we are going to bring out, playing Sarek in Star Trek Discovery, please welcome James Frame. Stage, there's just we can just see this guy, and now God was a little room. So, welcome to Star Trek Las Vegas. <laughs> this is your first connection. Hello, the Coliseum. <laughs> yeah, are you entertained? Yes, Gladiator 2000. And, ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for Ethan Peck. <laughs> Father, son, hug. By the way, you guys look alike. Yeah. I mean, like the you, you the casting on this is just is just fantastic. All right, I, I just gotta say, let's just cut to the chase for a second here. So, so you you get the script for the season finale, uh, season two finale, and you saw just read through the script, the stakes, the epicness of it all, and then you got to the last moment where Discovery just goes, you know. Whoosh, uh, what did you guys think? Like, what was your take, your first impression when you read that last part of the season two finale screenplay? I wasn't in it, so I didn't read it. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> still no? Uh, no, I was. I wasn't. Um, yeah, I mean, it was kind of mind blowing, and um, but it was more mind blowing. I remember watching it because we saw they had a screening on the big screen. And it's so cinematic, it was so fantastic to see it, you know, on that scale. Like, everyone should see it on the big screen. And, and, and after that, there were a lot of people saying, wow, we should do screenings in theaters of the whole. Yeah. 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 You know, I mean, why not? They do, they do screen theater shows from England now, so why not do Star Trek? Just saying, you might want to write to your congressman. <laughs> Ethan. Yeah, I was actually told about what the finale, what would happen at the end of the season um, at a dinner that I had with um, Alex Kirstner and a bunch of the, uh, the higher-ups, the producers and stuff. And he kind of took me through those final moments. And I remember being like, almost, almost moved to tears because this, was, this has been such an emotional uh, and incredible journey for me. Um, and I was still in the middle of the season and just to like know that I was going to be a part of this sort of soaring narrative uh, that kind of ties up, um, you know, canon, uh, ties it into canon and being such a huge part of that. Um, I was just like, I don't know, this is all so surreal, it's like living a dream, you know, so it's been pretty continuous and that was one of the first moments where I was like, this is going to be really special and, uh, and, I, and I can't believe I get to be a part of it. Well, season two, obviously, one of the things that we were really looking forward to was seeing the both of you together, seeing Spock and Sarah <laughs> together. So. Tell, tell us about the first time that you met just as actors and the first scene that you shot together. Well, I think we spoke on the phone first. Um, so uh, James's wife directed my first episode, which was really cool, uh, Marta Cunningham. And um, she put me in touch with him. You know, I was just like digging and searching for as much sort of information and help that I could find in preparing for this character. <laughs> This like very special character that means a lot to a lot of people, and I was very scared, very terrified. And we exchanged some text messages, and um, you had mentioned uh, sort of um, including like the way of the samurai, right? Can you can we speak about that a little bit? But, like the, the nobility and respect of the samurai. God, that was a really good note. I, I don't remember <laughs> yeah, that. It was a boring cool. note. Yeah, it was very cool. <laughs> oh, I should be using that in my interviews tomorrow. Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Um, but yeah, and then when did we meet? I think I think I met you uh, in prosthetics in the trailer. 
for the first day that day. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then I remember you came on and you had the ears on and the, and the hair and the eyebrows and you had like, the terror in my eyes. Yeah, and you're like, I mean, do I look ridiculous? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, but you know what? It's okay. <laughs> Just roll with it. It doesn't. It looks fine on screen. Trust me. Yeah, I actually have a really good photo of us from that first day, or our only day. We only had one day together, right? Yeah, we did because, um, as you all know, there is the backstory which we had to honor, which is that they had not been speaking for 18 years, and so they had created a scene in which Spock was so far gone because he was in his trauma that I couldn't relate to him. But we were in the same room, we were in the same scene, we spent the whole day on set together, and then we got to know each other really well, really quickly, and stay friends. And it's not until we kind of do these events where it's like, we did one scene. But also, I do. I think we should give a little bit of love to Baby Spark. Oh, Baby oh, Spark. Yeah. yeah. When I came on set and I saw that kid, I was like, where did you find him? And he was like, hello, father. <laughs> he was so perfect. I'm like, dude, you're awesome. Just go. Do your thing. So I got to film with him too because there's the uh, the flashback, and um, I really wanted him to feel. I guess he'd already been on set with you, but um, you know, I feel like when there's a kid on set, you you want him, you want them to feel comfortable and safe and whatever. And I was always like, hey man, like you doing okay? Like anything you need from me? And he was like, no, thank you. <laughs> he was like so polite and so logical and just like not needing anything. You know, I want to ask. So so you know. Obviously, Leonard Nimoy and Mark Leonard, and then you have you have Zachary Quinto and uh, Ben Cross from the uh, Kelvin Timeline movies. So you know, even though you only had the one scene together, you still had to establish a your own version of their relationship that would stand different from those relationships, but also sort of be familiar to people who are very well versed in those relationships. So. How much freedom did you have to obviously establish your own version of that, but you know, you still gotta like tip your hat to, to the originals? Truly, we're just winging it. Yeah, I believe that. We, we are, you know, it's, it's the, the, the real work is done in the writing, um, and they've done such a fantastic job of creating. Uh, that, you know, that segue into all these different character beats and, and they've also done, I mean, such a brilliant job on creating Michael Burnham and her relationship with Sarek and so, and, and with Amanda and so we had this kind of family unit that was already built up and so when Ethan came in, it just kind of slotted into place. It, it, it had all been, the, the writing on this I think is exceptional, so we're, we're very heavily supported by that. Yeah. Yeah. The, you know, I want to ask. So, when we first see Spock in, uh, in season two, he's not obviously not the Spock that we are familiar with. So, so Ethan, was that was that sort of liberating a little that you didn't have to jump right into playing a version of the Spock that everyone knew? Yeah, very much so. Um, I don't. I mean, hats off to Zachary Quinto for just jumping right into that because. I had the the pleasure of um, the convenience, not the convenience, the um, the gift of uh, of him being so unraveled at the beginning of the season, and then kind of earning my way to uh, eventually what becomes Nimoy Spock, but in his direction. Um, yeah, so I, I was very glad. At first, I was surprised, obviously, by the beard. Um, I got a call from Alex, and he was like, "Don't shave," and I was like, "What?" Like, I'm playing Spock, right? And um, and then it ended up staying. You know, I thought that beer was going to go away after a couple of episodes. And um, But yeah, I'm so grateful that I got to live in that space with that character for so long. And as I said, earned my way to the Spock that we know and love. Uh, Zach, did you ever meet Zachary Quinto? Uh, we met very, very briefly. This is so Hollywood. We met at like a, at an Oscar party, like for five seconds. And he, he was like passing by, we'd actually exchanged phone calls, but his schedule was crazy, my schedule was crazy. And um, it, he, it was in passing. I didn't realize he was so tall, first of all. He's like 6'3 or 6'2. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, Zach, what's up? It's me, it's Ethan. 
and we had this great moments and uh, you like go Spock hey Spock what's up Spock not quiet not quiet but um he did, did he get a selfie no ah! um but we did have a moment he's like you know this is something that will more or less like bind, bind us forever you know in some way so but i have yet to really sit down and speak with him but i look forward to it it'll happen someday uh i want to ask so season one to season two from the moment the first episode of season two started, the moment that Anson now, as Captain Pike, stepped off the transported platform, like, this is going to be a different show, this show is going in a completely different direction. So, both of you, from, from, because you were there from the beginning of the first season, like, what did you feel, what kind of differences did you feel in moving forward on production on season two, with all the changes that were going on, with your coming on, with Anson now being there? Um, well, that's a big question to answer. Um, you know, because they rolled it out, I mean, they, we, we get the scripts relatively late to shooting, don't you think? I arrived when that stopped happening. Okay. So, because they would, I, I heard that sometimes you would get them like the day before and would have speeches. Yeah. Right. I didn't, I wasn't, I got mine like weeks in advance. Oh, wow. Thank okay. goodness. So yeah, so I mean, a lot of the time, well, a lot of the time in season one, we, we'd get the script the day before or the week before, and we really didn't know how that was going to evolve. But um, I was really excited to see what was going to happen at season one because at the end, when I when I read the end of season one finale, it was like, and then the Enterprise shows up. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> how are they going to do that? What's going to happen? They had to wait nine months. <laughs> Um, but I love what they did. I think it was so bold and so um, so brilliant. And the whole Red Angel thing and the way that paid off. Yeah. Bearded Spark. Bearded Spark. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it hits the Spark. I know you have discussed this elsewhere. We've talked about it elsewhere. But the how you got the role, uh, the meeting you had with Nimoy's family. Yeah. Can you just take us through that? Yeah, I mean, you mean from casting and all that? Just like, like when you I'll got like your audition yeah, yeah. and who told you you got the role? Who was the first person you told? Yeah, um, so I had a, an audition that I had to put on tape. Um, uh, right, we have to sometimes either go in and audition for something, sometimes we have to make a tape ourselves of the scenes that they give us to audition with. And I sent in a tape for um, this codenamed project. I knew that it was Star Trek. I didn't know what character it was for, though. And um, in retrospect, it's like very obvious, but it was um, Tom the Andorian was like, is how Spock was dis uh, disguised in the audition sides. And, um, and so I made a tape, uh, and then I went in for the showrunners, and then I went in again, and they wrote me a new scene for that final audition. And from that scene, I could discern that it was Spock. And I was just like, I couldn't believe I was that far along in the process with such an iconic character, right? Because this is a, this is a role that you that you dream of um, as an actor that you know does really incredible things for you, and gives you such rarefied life uh, life experience. Um, and it, and I was also really scared because I uh, taking on this character was is a huge responsibility, and I didn't feel that I was up to it necessarily. Um, obviously, Kurtzman did, and that was you know. That faith was so instrumental in my um, really diving wholeheartedly into it. Um, but so after the final audition, which I like blacked out for because I was so terrified, um, I got a text message the next day from Orly Sidowitz, who's the casting director, and it just said, Welcome aboard, Mr. Spock. And I was like, Oh my gosh. I was, um, I was uh, walking right near my apartment. I'd actually just come out of like a massage because it'd been a stressful week, and um, uh, and I sat down on the curb and I, I I cried for like ten minutes because I was so overwhelmed and so overjoyed, and um, you know as I said like that's the moment you wait for is to get this kind of role and that can potentially change your life and make things more comfortable for you, um, and then the next week CBS uh, set up this meeting with um, Julie and Adam Nimoy and uh, and their partners. And um, that was also totally surreal and insane. I was driving over the 405 South. I grew up in LA, and it was at this um, restaurant that like, I grew up going to with my high school sports teams, like right near my high school. 
And so it was just all very surreal and they were so warm and, and lovely. And actually I saw Terry today, um, who's married to Adam. I'm sure you guys have seen her. She's so wonderful. Uh, they all were so wonderful. They're all so warm and so uh, curious. And I think I was, you know, I had doubts about whether, whether or not to be able to do it, like really do it. And um, I think we were all just there kind of like, well, like, here it goes. <laughs> you know, wish you the best. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it was such an amazing meeting. And it was sort of the first step in feeling like worthy of doing it. Um, and I feel that they really gave that to me. And, and it was huge for me. So, you know, wow. Applause for that. Like, you know, the. So, I mean, how great is Ethan at Spock? We were, we were all like, wow, whoa. And how great is James as Sarah? I was so nervous he was going to say that next, and then there was going to be like a... <laughs> and I was going to have to go like that to try and amplify it. <laughs> but here's the thing, so, so, you know, when they created the character of Spock in 1964, you know, the, the, the Cage pilot was filmed in December of 1964. So everyone talks about 66 being the year it was 64. But, you know, Leonard was there from the beginning. He had to, he had to find his way because when you go back and watch the original series, for the first, I would say, six or seven episodes, yeah. Nimoy's performance isn't quite there yet. You could see that he's trying things. He was kind of a wise ass in a couple of episodes, you know, in a Vulcanish kind of wise ass way. Shouty Spock? Yeah. Shouty Spock! The end the women! You know? <laughs> Damage control reports all stations! Yeah, he, he screams a lot. <laughs> but he stopped doing that. You, you did your homework. Um, so, like, you know, you guys too also had to create your own versions of these characters. So, really, Playing a Vulcan, playing someone who is logical, but someone who shows enough emotion so they're relatable in a way that you can feel empathy for them. What are the challenges of playing a Vulcan? Yeah, you get to do less than me. I mean, because you're not human. Well, that makes it harder for him. That's what makes it harder for yeah. him because you don't have the human side. Yeah, I mean, I was really... Um... Two things really helped me with that. One was doing the research and finding out that the, the backstory of the Vulcans was that, in fact, they were, in their origin, a very passionate people, and that they'd had a terrible war, a, a kind of a nuclear war, that they came out of and survived, and they came to the conclusion that it was out of control passions that had caused this war that nearly drove them into extinction, and so they deduced from that, they had to get rid of those passions, or they had to suppress them and replace them with pure reason. So that was very helpful to me, because it was like, oh, I see, it's not that they don't have emotion, it's that they don't trust it. And so therefore, it's there, it's behind the eyes, it's in the soul, as it were, and, and they have, you know, he has, they, they have this kind of mystical practice as well. And then also, um, Sarek has married a human wife, which is pretty extraordinary. And I, and I kind of, you know, when we were look, building the character, I was thinking about that as well. I was like, how did that come about, you know? That's a little bit rock and roll of him. <laughs> to hook up with a human, I was like, all right, Sarek. Got something going on. So yeah, those two things. And then I saw the famous uh, episode where Mark Leonard has that huge breakdown um, in the original. Isn't it? It's with the card, I think. Yeah, oh, it's right it's the next gen. Yeah, next gen. But I mean, amazing, amazing scene. And, and so that was revelatory as well, because it's like, and there it all is, you know? Oh, yeah. There it all is coming out. So it's about containing, 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 which most screen acting is about. It's just you're taking it as far in and as far narrow as possible without disappearing into nothingness. <laughs> so that was that was the challenge. Like how little can you do and yet still communicate? So so yours is obviously different, but again, I mean you'd have to kind of just talk about that. But when we get to the end of the season, I mean I was kind of we were all waiting for this moment. 
because clearly the Enterprise is there. You see the bridge of the Enterprise at Holy Toledo. The bridge of the Enterprise looked fantastic in Discovery. And that moment, right? Holy Toledo! The bridge of the Enterprise in Discovery. And it looked a little like the old, but of course it looked very, very modern, uh, 23rd century modern. But when Spock walks out of the turbo lift, and he's, he's Spock. Yeah. Tell me about, tell us about filming that scene. Oh, I mean, you see the smile on my face. It was so tremendous. Um, I had known, you know, as I said, from that dinner with uh, Alex and some of the producers, that Spock would end there, uh, back on the Enterprise, in his science officer uniform, clean shaven, clean bangs. Um, and I was, uh, it, it's, it's, it's still kind of hard to articulate because, as I said, it's just been so surreal and it's, you know, um, I think I think I could spend a lifetime kind of processing the magnitude of Star Trek and of Spock. And I mean, like, look at the community that it's created and, um, and what it means to people. Um, it's really beautiful. I feel very, very lucky. Very, it's, a, it's a privilege to do this and to be here. Um, but yeah, so that was like, it, it was only one day that we filmed uh, with the clean shaven look. And the first, the first day I came out on set with that look, people didn't recognize me, which was like really kind of fun and cool. Like I got to surprise everybody and like meet everybody again because I was had the beard the whole time. And um, uh, yeah, it's it's hard to put into words. It was just like I I had, as I said, I felt like earned my way into um, back onto the Enterprise, um, not just as Ethan but as Spock. And, um, and then to suddenly be him, it felt like. Like in, that, in those last moments, I really felt like, now I'm Spock. And um, it was like I'd been snuck into it or something. Like it had happened very quietly. And suddenly I was on the Enterprise in my science officer uniform. And um, it was magic. I mean, that's like hallowed ground, you know? Did you, did you keep anything? <laughs> I might, I might have. <laughs> Could you? Yeah, I can't say. <laughs> James, did you keep like a, the bob, like a like one of the bolts of the ears, or you know? Of course, I kept some ears. <laughs> I, I have some ears too. I actually have um, the scene that we did in the Vulcan crypt. Do you remember on the back of the wall they had the, all those Vulcan heads? Yeah. Uh, and then they had that light board behind it that was shining the light through. Yeah. One of those Vulcan heads was taken from a cast of me that they did right at the beginning. Oh yeah, I remember that. And it was like, it was, it was in the scene, but it was like, I was looking over, I was like, that's my head. <laughs> Eboy's head was up there too. It was? Yeah. Ooh. How about that? And here we are in the Leonard Eboy Theater. <laughs> yeah, I w uh, well, they gave me the head. <laughs> I got the head, they gave me the head. I've got it in a perspex box at home. I had it put in a perspex box. Wow. That's it so cool. Thing. Yeah. But had I known that Moy's head was there, I would have taken that too. <laughs> That's kind of taken a little bit of the sting off it. <laughs> when when see when the the discovery ended, season two ended, and I watched it again immediately, uh, I just thought, oh, I, I would do anything to see a further adventure of the Enterprise with Captain Pike and Mr. Spock at number one. And I just, what do we do? And then I saw online people like starting like petitions to do another spinoff show, which I signed like four of them. And then I go to Comic Con, and I've been going to Comic Con like 19 straight years. And I've been in that whole age thing, I know it's crazy, but look at the hair, I'm old. So, but I've seen all sorts of great panels there, but the, the Star Trek panel that was at Comic-Con this year was fantastic. And I got my wish with short treks. Like, we're gonna see the further adventures of the Enterprise. Like, it's like, yeah. how fun filming that. Uh, yeah, it was amazing because when I uh, put down the years, I wasn't sure I'd ever pick them up again. Mm. Um, and it was such a joy to go back and revisit that character because the second time around, it wasn't, um, I wasn't riddled with terror, you know, because I'd already done it and, and it was, it, it, just, it felt so much more freedom um, 
uh, in myself as an, as an actor, and that was really wonderful and, and just more comfortable. And um, yeah, I can't wait for, for, I can't wait to see them. I haven't seen them yet. Um, and I can't wait for you to see them because it's gonna explore some very cool relationships that um, I think you'll be excited about. I do wanna say as well, and I'm sure this is your experience, that um, so much of what was amazing about filming the show and so much of what was amazing about building the relationship, because your characters only really exist in relationships with other characters, was working with Sonequa, who is, Give it up for Sequel Martin Green. Oh my. You know, you can't, I, I can't say enough good things about Sonequa. She's an incredible actress, but she is a really warm, beautiful human being. And she is so generous and so giving and so present. And so working with her was a huge part of building those characters and building those relationships. And I'm, I'm sure you felt the same. Oh my gosh, yeah, she's so giving, she's so generous. Um, and I, I, before I got the role, I told my managers, one of whom is here somewhere, uh, I was like, I don't know if I could do this if, um, if it's not a supportive set. And I just couldn't have walked into a more supportive, warm, loving, caring, uh, and careful situation. And which she spearheads, you know, she sets the tone for all of us. And, you know, we got on phone calls and talked about backstory because I wanted to get really specific about but when's the last time we spoke? How do we feel about each other? What you know? How do we feel about this? And she was just so game. And the very first time I met her, um, I was uh, by the trailers where right we hang out in between filming, and um, she shouted from across the parking lot and was like, "I've been waiting for you." And she'd seen my tape, and she came up and gave me this big hug and was just like, "You know, I'm so excited to begin working with you." And um, it was a dream. It was. It was just. It couldn't have been better. And she can't be better. Sonequa Martin Green, of the course of all these shows and movies, is one of the absolute finest actors to ever grace a Star Trek stage. She is just so amazing. She's phenomenal. Yeah, I think the body of work that she has ahead of her is going to be exceptional. I think she is in the absolute highest rank of actors. Yeah, she's really starting. And, and it's, uh, it, it was a privilege to work with her, no doubt. One of the most touching moments between the two seasons that we've seen so far is when Michael says to Spock, find that person who seems farthest from you and reach for them. Let them guide you. Obviously, that is a harbinger for meeting James T. Kirk. And that moment is, was one of the things that made me hope for further adventures of, of the Enterprise with Pike and Spock and number one, because really that could happen sooner because, you know, in this period of time, Kirk was on the Farragut with Captain Garavik, so the Enterprise could come across the, Gar the, the Farragut with Lieutenant James T. Kirk and Spock could meet Kirk, and there you go. You've already written this. I have already written this! <laughs> He's got a script right under that desk. You're like, James, take it with you. Well, now's a great time for questions, and I think we got first one right there. Hello. Um, I Hi. was wondering, if you got the chance to speak to Leonard Nimoy, what would you say? For both of you? Oh, man, that's a great question. It's a great question. <laughs> I don't know. I so like, like, what's up, you know, my... Yeah, be like, hey, what's up? How are you? Um, no, I mean, I'd have so much to say. I feel like emotional even thinking about it. You know, he's created this, this character, uh, and uh, yeah, I don't. I'd be, I'd be a little dumbstruck. Um, I'd probably just thank him. Thank you. What about you? What would you say? Right here, you're next. Absolutely. That's exactly what I'd say. I mean, what else can you say? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, Star Trek's become such a part of modern mythology that when you say a name like Spock or Saren, it's almost like it's almost like saying, you know, you're going to play a Roman, or you're going to play Wyatt Earp. There's a set of expectations that comes along with it that other people have. Mm -hmm. How did you guys balance your own individuality with those expectations that come with those characters? Mm. Right question. You first. Um, I just decided not to worry about it. 
honestly, because at a certain point, you know, that just is not helpful. Um, and I just, I just trusted the writing, and I really was a great admirer of, of, uh, of what Mark had done. And um, I just kind of decided to just go in and go, and not think about all of that other stuff because that doesn't really help you build those relationships and make those scenes come to life, you know. So at a certain point, you have to just put that to one side. Yeah, I totally, I feel like I, I went into sort of a state of isolation because I knew that I would create my best work um, without the obligation, right? Without other people's expectations in my head, right? The, uh, I was announced and like I, I, and I still haven't gone online, but I never went online to see what people thought or anything like that because I just needed to uh, live through that in my own way. Um, and yeah, I guess I also kind of decided like I'm just not going to worry about that, and just trust um, trust that I'm surrounded by the people that are, that are going to get me there, and that I'm going to do enough work and research to get myself there, and and I think that's what happened. So I don't know. And you know what as well, I have to tell you, it's so much fun making this show. We have such a good time. You're just so busy having a great time doing this that you kind of forget about all the other stuff anyway. You know? Yeah, you're totally absorbed. It's like, and then you come to these conventions and you're like, oh. <laughs> wow, yeah. I see. But it's like, yeah, it's like a, it's like a weird little world that, that we work, work in up there. Yeah. Those stages create such a specific environment. It's like walking into uh, a spaceship, literally. It's like walking onto another planet. What, I feel like at this point, 2019, probably no one knows more about Star Trek, especially uh, behind the scenes and the production of Star Trek, than Jonathan Frakes. Yeah. So yeah. here's, here's Here? an actor who became a director across many platforms of TV and film. He directed episodes of Next Gen, DS9, Voyager, uh, he directed two films, and he directed, I think, three episodes of uh, Discovery. So tell, tell us about your experiences working with John. Oh my gosh, yeah, he's amazing. He was instrumental, in my opinion, uh, uh, in my form, forming of Spock. And he directed the first episode where Spock is somewhat um, uh, clear-headed, um, becoming more clear-headed. And so it's sort of the first time that he began to open his mouth and speak. And I was like really afraid of that because he's still in a state of disarray, right? Psychologically and emotionally. And so he was really um, uh, just caring of me in that situation and helping me find that balance and uh, very delicately tuning my performance. And um, I'm just so grateful to him for that. Is he here? Uh, not today. Oh, okay. I think he's here tomorrow. Okay, James, what about you? I, I didn't work with him. Oh, oh, he didn't with right, right. That's why I went with Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> really, you never got to work with him? No. Oh, man. Hopefully someday. <laughs> I don't know, right? Yeah. Yeah, he's amazing. Hey. Next question. Hi, uh, this question is for Ethan. Um, the relationship between Spock and Burnham was so beautifully done. There's this fun, you know, sibling rivalry with um, a lovely, uh, like, mutual admiration. And I was just wondering if, um, how you made that connection um, and whether or not it mirrored your relationship with Sonequa. Uh, yeah, uh, great question. Um, it definitely mirrored what happened off camera. I mean, we just kind of, again, to call back to how amazing she is, we just like dove in um, from the beginning. And I still like, you know, give, you know, throw sarcastic remarks and burns at her because we enjoy just like breaking each other's balls so much. And so that happened a lot off camera and it definitely, I think, translated uh, onto camera. And um, yeah, I can't really answer that beyond uh, saying that it was just a, like a mutual understanding that we would, we would just dive headfirst into this. Also, I have an older sister, and so I can kind of, it's not a totally alien relationship to me. Um, and she has siblings as well. She, right? She has a couple siblings? I'm totally, yeah, she I'm totally speak with us. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so, you know, we just, um, we just accepted each other for that. Thank you. Hello, Ethan. Hello, James. Are you awake? 
over there, James? I'm... <laughs> <laughs> oh, what? Sorry. Uh, thank you all for coming, and I think you guys did really fantastic, awesome work. Thank you so much. Uh, I think that's why the second season was just wonderful. Um, both of you can answer this question. I, um, Ethan, I was a big fan of your grandfather, uh, Gregory Peck, and I really appreciated his civil rights work and his activism in Hollywood. Yeah, yeah. Um, we really need someone like him today. Um, I was wondering, do you think he'd be proud of you and Star Trek and oh, yeah. the whole world Star Trek has uh, created? I hope so. I, you know, I think. Uh, as I've gotten older, I wish so badly that he were alive because I have so many questions for him. This is such a sort of treacherous profession that we're in, and, um, and it's difficult to navigate at times. And he had so much experience. I mean, like, it's crazy to really think about who he was. As, as I get older, it becomes kind of stranger and more wild to me. Uh, much in the way that now that I'm in this position, it's like, how have these, how have these, uh, situations overlapped, and how do I get to live in the middle of it? It's very wild. Um, yeah, I really hope that he would be. I think he would be, because I think that um, Spock is so virtuous, he's so noble, and he uh, he's a humanist, and I think that my grandfather was, and I think that I think that he loved that I was doing this, and feel uh, uh, really proud, I hope. Yeah. What do you think he would think of me, Father? <laughs> <laughs> you ever meet him? No. Um, I, of course he'd be proud. Come on. <laughs> um, but I think also, you know, to your point, um, he would appreciate Star Trek's vision. Um, it's, it's a very positive version of the future and that we're still putting out there um, where we're not divided and turned against each other, where we're working together and where people are seeking to make connections and build families and build societies, I think that's very much in keeping with the civil rights vision, and I think that he would have appreciated that a lot. Yeah, and embracing our differences and seeing them as uh, strengths and not hindrances. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Back this way. Hi. Um, I have a lot of Star Trek fan co-workers, and we are very, very curious about one thing that's driving us crazy all season. Where's Cybok? Uh, did that movie actually happen? <laughs> yes. Uh, we can't tell. Can't tell you. I was going to say that. <laughs> um, we know, and we can't tell you. I'm just going to give no idea. I wish, I wish we did, though. There are snipers in the building. Probably. We are sworn to a certain amount of secrecy. I'm so sorry. Next question back this way. Um, Hi. Hello. Sorry. Um, well, so you guys just both have such an interesting perspective in coming into characters that have already been established and coming into it, you know, with enough years of this whole universe being established. And so just what... Um, Based within that perspective, just what you learn, what stuck with you, what's like the one thing that's really struck you and will you'll carry with you into the future? Kira, right? More. More, okay. That's okay. Wow, good question. Mm -hmm. So much. The friendships that we formed. Oh, that's cool. The, we're very tight as a cast and we've formed very deep friendships and that has sustained and, and carries on and I think we'll be the legacy for us into the future, right? Really. Yeah. Yeah, that's a crazy thought, huh? We're, we're so close to its completion still. You know, there's so many years ahead of this, potentially. It's amazing to think of. Um, but for me personally, uh, I don't know if you felt this way, um, but as I said, I was so frightened going into, uh, into play this character. And um, coming out of it, I feel so much stronger and more confidence, and that that will, I don't think, ever change. I feel like I've done something that, you know, totally shook me in my boots, but I um, I wasn't crushed by it. And um, it it was revealing of myself to myself, if that makes sense. And so I feel just very grateful for that. That's awesome, thank you. Captain, you have the con. Uh, Mr. Crane, um, 
in both seasons, Sarek and Burnham have a lot of uh, very emotional, quiet scenes together. Mm -hmm. Did you have to rehearse them a lot in order to figure out how to play them, or are we just seeing your first take off and on, on how the interaction should work? That's a really good question. Um, I think, you know, to, to, to hark back what I was saying about Sonequa is that she's so uh, well prepared and she's so present as an actress that um, sometimes in those kind of situations I find that doing too much rehearsal can take from the spontaneity of what you can find in the moment and that when you get to a certain level of confidence with a character and, 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 and with an actor, that you go in there kind of open and you see what happens. And that generally was my experience of working with Sonequa. We both would have ideas about what we thought, but we didn't really talk about it. And we came in and we just came in in character and started talking to each other and reacting and then kind of seeing what would happen. And then the director would sort of shape the scene around that. So yeah, it was being, it was being created as close to the moment of, of filming as possible so that it could be as spontaneous and as felt as possible. Oh, excellent job. <laughs> Back this way. Hi, gentlemen. My name is Aaron. Um, my question's for both of you. Obviously, coming into such iconic roles that have been played by multiple other actors, um, I guess my question was, was there any one instant uh, where each of you looked at the script and said, I, we hear a lot of times about actors adding their own things, maybe tweaking the lines a little bit, adding kind of your own flavor to it. Was there any instant that you could tell us about where maybe you did that during Discovery, or was it very much by the script? Never touched it. The script was word perfect. Yeah, same here. I, I never mess with it. I wouldn't have dreamed of, honestly. <laughs> I, would. I had too much respect for what they did. Thank you. Thanks for Thank you. Okay, next question. Gilman Rand. Um, so, there are so many iconic actors who've been part of Star Trek, and they all come together at conventions. So I'm wondering who you have either met so far, or are looking forward to meet, that geeks you out the most? <laughs> Great question. I kind of have a story about that. So, uh, for my very, uh, my first table read with Jonathan Frakes, um, I, <laughs> I was very excited to meet him, and I had him this before he like knew me, and I had him sign my table read script, and he was like, I was like, Jonathan, you know, he like gave me some notes, and then I was like, um, will you sign my script? And he was like, huh? He's like, no, no, it's for me. And I could see that, that moment where he was like, is this a strange weirdo person? Um, and he signed my script, and I was just, I, I wanted like a, I wanted a, like a, t a talisman, I wanted a, uh, like an imbued artifact to take forth and bring me good luck. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and so I made him give me one. Um, I think he's a little weirded out by it, but uh, now we just we get along so well, I, I, I think so. Uh, but that was sort of a silly moment for me where I was a bit starstruck. I geek out, out of meeting everyone. <laughs> Geeking out is just a thing I do. Um, but my favorite one today was meeting the woman who does the voice of Discovery. Yeah. I want to meet her. Yeah. I didn't know there was someone doing a voice of Discovery. She's on her own in a booth somewhere, and she came over to say hi, and then she whispered in my ears some Discovery stuff, and I was like, what? That's crazy. <laughs> she does the whole thing. I thought it was run through a computer. I, in fact, I didn't even think about there being a voice of discovery. I just believed in it. <laughs> it's, you know, I mean, you'd think I'd have figured it out by now. So that's, an important, that's an important... But it's all being made up. <laughs> so yeah, that was really cool today. You should be on. Well, Jake James, you know, the voice of the Enterprise was Major Baron Rotner. So that's a big job to be the voice of discovery. Uh, back here, last question. Um, question for James. I hope this doesn't come off like an OCD question, but you know, the, uh, in the 30 or 50 years of Star Trek with Mark Leonard and Ben Cross, the pronunciation of the name has always been Sarek. In Discovery, I mean, particularly Sinequa, I mean, she keeps saying Sarek. And I didn't know if you 
notice perhaps maybe the differentiation in the pronunciations because every time I hear it, I just it's very noticeable, and I just was wondering if you and the other you know members of the cast have noticed. <laughs> Not until now. <laughs> we can always reshoot. <laughs> we dub it. Oh, so just dub it. Potato, potato. So sorry. <laughs> All right, we do have one more question. This is the last one. Hey, Scott. How you doing? How are you? Uh, this question's for James. You talked earlier about how you prepared for your role as Sarek. Sarek. And... <laughs> All right, keep laughing. How did you compare to, to prepare for that role compared to your role in Orphan Black, which is such a convoluted role? I find these questions so hard to answer because it's such um, it's it's such a sort of intuitive and internal and kind of private process that happens when you're kind of feeling your way into a part. It's it's especially for me. It's it, you know I do a certain amount of research and a certain amount of thinking, but then the rest of it is just kind of feeling my way into it. And so um, honestly. Every part that I've done, I approach that way. I kind of figure out what the kind of structure of it is, and then I'm literally trying to feel my way in. And then at a certain point, um, I can feel that the character has taken over. Um, but a lot of the time, I'm not really conscious of that process happening, and I just kind of have to trust that it is. Every now and then, I'm like, is it happening? I don't know if it's happening. We start shooting in a week. Um, but then some, then it sort of happens, and so it's okay. <laughs> but yeah, it wasn't radically different comparing for Ferdinand, but it was quite similar because it was, you know, again, working with a powerhouse actress who was phenomenal and very generous and present, and working with tremendous scripts. So, you know, the work of the character has really been begun by the writers, and, and they provide the scaffold. Um, I, I always say that it comes it comes down to the writers, the the real creators of the character. Well, those writers had their work cut out for them because you know, like, just when you when you saw that discovery went nine hundred fifty years into the future, like that opens up nine hundred fifty years. Yes, nine hundred fifty. How did you figure that out? They said it. Ah. Uh -huh. <laughs> what you're saying is you listened to what they said. I watched it twice. Uh -huh. <laughs> but. Right, so it just opens up so many possibilities. Like, first of all, it's it's definitely the furthest into the future that any Star Trek show has gone. But also, like, is the Federation still even around? Um, you know, are we have we explored more of the galaxy? I mean, who knows? Like, what do you? What would you like when you read that? It, it just went into the future. Like. What did you think, like... Hmm, well, we don't even know if they made it. I mean, they made just to be, like, puddles of flesh on the ground. It's just, <laughs> like, 950 years is a really long time. Yeah, yeah. But we'll see, and it won't be much of a season three if that's the case. But it's, it's always a risk. Time travel. I'm just saying. I think one of the most exciting parts of it is, is, um, is designing what, uh, what the props will be. Right? Oh, like, yeah. think about that. Yeah. That's crazy. Totally. What will phasers look like? What will what will anything look like? What will the I Enterprise seen, look like? I have seen some of the props. Yeah. What do they look like? Yeah. What? What do they look like? I can't tell you. Aww. Aww. They're really cool though. Ooh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they better be, right? I hope so. Well, ladies and gentlemen, give it up. Right now. Thanks, Brain. Keep it packed, ladies and gentlemen.